ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन वन जॉइनिंग अस दिस मॉर्निंग एंड वेलकम वी आर जस्ट गोन वेट अ मिनट और टू for all the participants to to get in and join us Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, so, good morning to you all, and welcome. My name is Jo Inchley, and I'm the director of the Triumph Network, based at the MRC CSO Social and Public Health Sciences Unit at the University of Glasgow. And it gives me great pleasure this morning to welcome you to our first online Triumph Early Career Researchers Forum. So, as many of you know, we had initially planned to run this event in person last spring, but as with many other events. we had to postpone uh, due to covid but during that time we've learned a lot about how to conduct meetings online and while it's always nice to meet face to face i'm aware that virtual meetings provide an opportunity for wider participation than might have been possible if we were meeting face to face in glasgow today so i'm delighted that we'll be joined by over 150 delegates from across the uk and internationally over the next couple of days as well as around 70 speakers and facilitators who will be presenting and running the sessions. So the other advantage of the delay is that we've been able to work more closely with some of the other UKRI funded mental health networks and this has become a truly joint event with the Emerging Minds network, eNurture network, the Loneliness and Social Isolation Mental Health Research network and the March network, as well as the Mental Health and the UKRI national support team. So in particular I'd like to just thank the members of our organizing committee Ellie Pierce, Sumi Chan, JJ Buckle, Emily Lloyd and Lynn Gilmore and the rest of the Triumph team Claire Spencer, Christina McMellan, Emily Cunningham and Annie Polkman. They've all done a fantastic job in bringing this event together. So as you know the focus of our forum is youth mental health and we all know that's an area of increasing concern in the UK and many other countries. we know that the majority of mental health problems first emerged during the adolescent years and research has shown quite worrying declines in young people's mental health and well-being in recent years and many of these concerns have been exacerbated by the covid pandemic as a result of the disruption to young people's lives their education their economic circumstances their social relationships and their leisure activities so triumph and many of the other mental health networks have been trying better understand the causes and consequences of poor mental health in young people and to help work in work together to identify effective solutions so i'm really excited that over the next couple of days we've got the opportunity to hear from 50 presenters who will be sharing the latest research findings in this field and for those presenting i hope that the forum will provide you with an opportunity to discuss your research in a supportive and safe environment where everyone's voice is heard although it's less easy online i hope there'll be lots of stimulating discussions arising from the presentations and that you'll be able to make connections with each other that will continue beyond this event in response to demand we've also organized a series of ask the expert sessions where you can hear more about a range of different topics relevant to a career in academia such as making an impact with your research with policy or on social media or applying for a grant and managing a research study so these sessions will provide a chance for much more focused dis discussion and questions in a smaller group context and many thanks to all our experts for joining us here and sharing your knowledge and experience with us just to let you know the ask the expert sessions will take place in breakout rooms which have been pre-allocated so when the time comes please click on the relevant zoom link in the program and you will be allocated from there obviously if you find yourself in a session that you're really not interested in you're free to leave but we wanted to give everyone the chance to benefit from all the sessions that are available 
as we've got a really great range of topics and presenters. So before we move on to, to the content of the day, I've just got a few housekeeping things to run through. So firstly, this first session and all the keynote sessions are webinar sessions, so your cameras are off, but please do use the chat to say hello and introduce yourselves if you'd like to. If you're active on Twitter, you might like to let people know you're here and that they can follow along on the live YouTube stream. You can use hashtag Triumph ECR to do that. Keynote sessions are being recorded and live streamed, but participants will not be visible or heard in these recordings and the rest of the sessions will not be recorded. As this is a large virtual event, it'd be handy to have your programme to hand as there are lots of different links for all the different sessions. So please use that to navigate where you need to go and when. As I said, for our keynote speaker sessions, we are on Zoom webinar and YouTube. And for the parallel Ask the Expert sessions, we'll be using Zoom meetings. We're here to help. So you can email the team at any stage at sphsu-triumph at glasgow.act.uk. So do contact us if you need signposting or help with accessing anything. And I also wanted to say that we want this to be a friendly and supportive space for all our participants. Sometimes we may be discussing sensitive and potentially distressing topics, and some of our fellow delegates may be personally affected. So let's all be conscious of our impact on others. And we do encourage you to look after yourselves. Please do step away if you need a break at any stage, or reach out to us or someone else if you're affected by any of the talks. So finally, I'm delighted to welcome our keynote speakers to the forum. We have three over the two days. Professor Rory O'Connor from Glasgow University, Professor Kay Tisdall from Edinburgh University, and Julie Cameron from the Mental Health Foundation. Rory, Kay, and Julie are all members of the Triumph National Management Group, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with their work already. I'm really looking forward to hearing their different perspectives on youth mental health and hearing a little bit about their professional journeys in this field. So we have a busy and exciting programme ahead. Thank you in advance for your participation. And I hope you have a really productive and stimulating uh, couple of days. So we'll move on now to our first keynote uh, from Professor Rory O'Connor. I'm delighted to welcome Rory here this morning. And um, many of you will know him already. Rory is Chair of Health Psychology and Director of the Suicidal Behaviour Research Laboratory at the University of Glasgow. He's also President of the International Association for Su Suicide Prevention and has recently published his new book, When It Is Darkest. As I said, Rory sits on the Triumph National Management Group. I'm delighted he's able to join us today. And um, just before Rory starts, if you have any questions for Rory, please put them in the Q&A. There will be time for a couple of questions at the end and any further questions we can uh, discuss throughout the rest of, of the forum. So thank you, Rory, and I'll pass over to you now. Thanks. Uh... Uh, Joe and welcome and thanks to um, Joanne, Lynn and Claire, everybody else behind the scenes who put together this event, which is really exciting and it's amazing seeing uh, over 150 people um, across the two days. So what um, I've been asked or what Lynn in particular said to me to do was give a sort of pretty informal talk about my journey. So I'm not talking, I'm not going to talk specifically about our, our, uh, the research we've been doing. We're going to talk a bit about the journey I've been on over the last 25 years um, and say something about what motivates me, what I find challenging, what I would do differently on reflection or with hindsight, a bit about what it's like to work in the field, and then maybe any sort of tips or reflections that I may have. So when I was doing this, um, and preparing for this yesterday, I was trying to think what the sort of key words or key things that I sort of could summarize my reflections or my what I think is important in the field. And so three, when I was doing this, I came up with this acronym. So acronym is a, it's not an acronym, it's a wrong word, it's a word. Um, so uh, can everybody see that yet? So can somebody just let me know of a thumbs up or something that you can see my screen? Yeah, okay. that's good, Rory. So, what, so basically what came up was, what it came up with was aspires. And this sort of, when I was reflecting um, and trying to whatever, make, it, make it work, um, reflects the things, 
a lot of, or probably everything I'm going to say over the next 15 minutes, because I'm going to ask to speak for about 15 minutes and then have maybe 10 minutes for comments or questions. And although every journey is unique and we all have a different experience, I'll talk about my experience, obviously. But for, but for me, what I'm hoping to say is encapsulated by these six words, which, um, which are, sorry, seven, I can't even count, these seven words under aspire. So it's on, I'll talk a bit across my next 15 minutes on authenticity, on the importance of serendipity and grasping it, uh, the vital role of passion in the work that we do, a bit about imposter syndrome, and of course, the inevitability of rejection in the work that we do. And then I'll then move and through my sort of journey discussion and what I've learned, a bit about engagement. And that engagement idea is not just one way, it's actually the system has to engage and support early career researchers as well as us researchers engaging with the system. And then, then self-care is also really, really important. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'll just put that up just to start. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen again. But for me, I think the, these words define, I think, what I've learned and how I try and conduct the work that I do in, in mental health research. So then if I sort of return or think back to my journey, I've stopped sharing the screen now, I think. Yeah, hold on, i end this bit. Um, is the, sorry, it's just it's end screen. Okay. That's a problem, two screens here. Okay, so when I think about my journey, it started off um, in the, uh, I started my undergraduate in 1991, uh, straight through to a PhD from, uh, in Belfast, I had just a psychology background and then, but I was doing my undergraduate work on depression actually and young adult, depressive symptoms in young, young adults and some experimental based work. And then I moved on to do a PhD which I completed in 97, also in Belfast, but looking at suicide. And this is where I, bet, I suppose the first one of the words, they're not in order, um, serendipity comes into place. Because I had planned, I'd applied for a PhD in, to continue to work on depression. I was going to look at psychophysiological aspects of depression in a sort of social context. But then it just so happens that I got a call the summer after I graduated, and I'd already applied for the PhD in depressive symptoms, but there's no funding associated with that. Um, and my, well, the person who turned out to be my PhD supervisor, Noel Sheehy, phoned me and said, oh, there's this opportunity for doing a PhD on suicide, but actually it was suicide in prisons. So I thought, well, that makes sense. Obviously it's an obvious um, next step in terms of the importance of, obviously the suicide has been the most devastating outcome for mental health problems. And so then the long story short is I, ended up doing a PhD with Noel. That initial funding never actually came off, but I'd already started the PhD and then the department, the School of Psychology at Queen's End offered me a scholarship. But I suppose the, part, the rule there was, the, the point there when I reflect was that sort of serendipitous nature of um, getting this call and then willing to take this risk on this other, uh, this other avenue. And I, I suppose I haven't looked back ever since in the, in the context of suicide, I've literally dedicated the last 25 years of my research career to try and understand suicide and self-harm. And that's been across the lifespan, not just among young people, but we all, we have done a lot of work with young people. Um, we've done work with adolescents and self-harm as well as young adults and, and looking at different sort of factors associated with risk and protection. And then in terms of my journey, my journey is pretty linear um, and really incredibly fortunate in the journey I had in that I, went straight from my undergraduate or my PhD into a lectureship and uh, which is so unusual nowadays and um, but in terms of one of the things I would probably have done differently on reflection is I I wish well it's mixed views on it but um, I wish I had the time and space to breathe between my PhD and the lectureship because as soon as I literally submitted my PhD on the Friday in Belfast and moved to Scotland um, for to, for a lectureship in Strathclyde in the Monday and uh, and had even had a bite or anything like that and then literally straight into trying to deliver lectures and stuff I literally didn't know about and having to then be one step ahead of the students so so I think that the reason I, I would have done that differently was having some time to breathe for my well-being and also just for give me a time in terms of um, I would have rather having a fellowship in between um, and then to give me some time to obviously consolidate my research skills 
and, and, and so on moving forward, because I think there was a hi hiatus between my finishing my PhD and then really I found a challenge and then to immediately set up a research team and or my research projects and so on um, because I was so overwhelmed with teaching and, and then I moved to a new country and I hadn't got the connections. And then I've just stayed in, in Scotland ever since, Stirling University, and then as a senior lecturer to professor and then professor and then moved to Glasgow in 2013. Um, and then the other bit, I suppose, important in my journey is early on, or in the, in the I think 2008, I think it was, I set up the Suicidal Behaviour Research Group, which then morphed into the Suicidal Behaviour Research Lab. And, and But really, I've really focused with, with some deviations, but primarily I've focused on one topic, which is suicide and self-harm. But I, I think, well, I've been lucky in that I've been able to conduct a whole range of different types of research um, in, in the context of uh, experimental, epidemiological, qualitative, quantitative, and the whole range of stuff, which has been really, really rewarding. Um, so that's really sort of a very brief journey. In terms of then what um, motivates me, and I think that this is so important in the field that we work in, in terms of mental health, is we genuinely can make a difference. And that the research that we do, then and the the co-production and collaborative nature of the work that really does characterize mental health research, um, I think is uh, in, in, incredible, it can be incredibly rewarding. It's emotionally draining, it can be, but it's in, incredibly rewarding. So we can make a huge and real impact. And my motto has always been, if I can make an impact and change one person's life for impact and how things affect one person, that's good enough for me. And indeed, I've been looking at the work that I've done, and I do a lot of public engagement work, that it's so important that we disseminate or get our work away from the ivory towers into real worlds of people's lives. And, um, and that's been, I mean, so we're, I think I feel so fortunate and honored to be able to do that. And um, in terms of what motivates me, that, that sense of being able to um, understand this complexity of this phenomenon known as suicide or self-harm, something which people often don't unless it directly affects you, don't, direct, um, don't really hone in on or focus on. Um, and I think we, we, with the work that we've been doing, my, and this is obviously all collaborative work with many, many different colleagues across different disciplines in Glasgow and beyond, and allowing us to understand this, the nuances and, and, and challenges of people's lives as they navigate their journeys. And for some, sadly, for 800,000 or 700,000 people each year across the globe, they lose the struggle to live. And then the other thing which motivates me is really um, meeting people affected by suicide. And, um, and obviously that happens in many different contexts and in the context of people who take part in our studies, as well as people who contact me um, and, and, and directly, either those who've been bereaved by suicide, those who attend my talks or people who've attempted suicide. And they, and that they find some solace in the work that we do as trying to understand why they feel the way that they do, or if they're bereaved, they help them understand what's happened in their loved one's lives. But then moving on to then what's challenging, um, and the challenging stuff is that working in mental health is emotionally challenging, and I actually brilliant, I was so delighted this week seeing that Susie Smiley and colleagues at the MRC unit at Glasgow have now launched this Scottish wide emotionally challenging group are working in emotionally challenging research. And that's not just mental health, but includes mental health. So that's fantastic because one of the most important things I think that I've learned over the years is the importance of, of peer support, obviously formal support as well, but then the nature of peer support. And certainly in my group in the Suicide Behaviour Research Lab, that peer support is provided by colleagues uh, and from everybody, from students, from obviously master students, PhD clinical students, the research staff, as well as tenured staff, I think that's so, so important that we're also trying to support each other. But certainly in terms of the early career researchers, they're absolutely amazing at supporting each other. I think it's also in terms of emotionally challenging, obviously that's the importance of the self-care and which I mentioned in the aspires um, word, this and that, but that self-care, of course, we have to all take time to look after ourselves, but the system and the university has to do more, I think. And we, we all need to have, we all have a responsibility and a role to support, to um, facilitate support and self-care. So make sure there's as few barriers as possible to that. Um, and it's also really important, I think, I certainly learned to recognize what you bring to your own research. So, so uh, Joe mentioned, I wrote a book this year, When It's Darkest, 
and that was sort of my 25 years of working in the field of suicide research and prevention. I've tried to combine my personal reflections with the research and, and, and professional reflections. And part of that reflection I did when writing the book was, was really acknowledge probably in, in print for the first time in detail, the impact of being bereaved by suicide twice myself, how that, what I bring, what that, those experiences have well, changed me as a person, but how they've impacted in the nature of the work that I do. And also my own mental health and recognizing, I, I talk about the fact that I, I see a therapist and that's been really important for my personal life as well as my professional life, but it's recognizing the whole complex world that we live in. So it's really trying to acknowledge that. And, and through that, that acknowledgement, um, I think we can grow uh, as people and as researchers. Um, then the, the other pictures, the last bit I'll say in challenging is I totally acknowledge it's huge challenges that the early career researchers face in terms of the really insecure market, in terms of job market and so on. So we, I, I, and I think what we, we as established researchers have to do is lobby even more strongly to try and have a more established pipeline. And it is difficult to do that in the, in the current climate, but that's something, something I try to do certainly from the rule that I have, because I do, it's so, so difficult from short-term contract to short-term contract. Then moving on then, and um, in terms of the, what I do differently, I've already said the idea about um, the not jumping straight into um, a lectureship, but again, I, I mean, I, I totally acknowledge that that's more way a very selfish thing to say, because I was very fortunate to do that. But just in reflecting in terms of my development as a researcher, I think it probably initially, impeded me. Um, in terms of the, the work, the broader work in the field of mental health, I think that what has been, when I reflect on 25 years ago, when I started out in this area, mental health, certainly suicide and suicide prevention really wasn't a priority. It wasn't talked about. I could, I remember when I did my first public lecture in the 90s in Belfast, and it, I mean, people were, some people maybe were even ashamed of saying that they were attending this talk on suicide. I remember somebody come up to me afterwards saying, I haven't told my family and friends that I'm here and because of the stigma, because they, because they had themselves had experienced suicidal thoughts and that's the reason why they were attending the lecture. But they, but they weren't able to share that or they didn't feel able to share that with others. And um, so we have moved forward, I think in the last number of years, and um, really the, the mental health now in terms of public discourses has improved, but we still have so far to go um, in terms of the narrative surrounding mental health. And actually, I think that our, when we think about mental health, is mental health problems such as depression and anxiety, we could really good at talking about those, but I think we haven't got as good at talking about psychosis or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, or whatever condition you want to talk about. So I think that there's been this dual track approach of how we've being destigmatized in mental health. We really have so much, I mean, such a task, but we are lucky in that we're able to inform that, that conversation. I'm now in a position as in various national and international roles have been able to do that. Um, so I think good progress, but we're still a long way to go. In terms of the sort of tips before sort of bring it in the last two or three minutes, I mean, uh, the passion, or the two, two or three things, passion, I just think that what drives me every morning is a passion to try and make a difference. And, and, and I think that passion is here in leaps and bounds and spades in the field of mental health science. So that's really, really fantastic. The whole idea of imposter syndrome um, and, uh, is vital that we touch on that because I still have imposter syndrome. And, and I think the day that I, obviously it's less but than what it was when I started out. But the day I stopped, feeling, oh my God, maybe I don't know this as well, or maybe there are I mean, gaps and challenges and misunderstandings or my own anxieties. If I, the, days I, the day I stop having those is the day I'll give up and retire, which hopefully will not be any day soon, because I think even though it's difficult in the moment, I think it, it, it helps me with my curiosity, hopefully it helps with my sense of compassion, both to myself. I don't think I looked after my mental health particularly well early on in my career, and it's something I've really started to do more and more now. So really that passion and seize the days when serendipitous events happen, maybe just try and seize it in, move out of your comfort, comfort zone. And that's what I again try and do is, it's dead easy once we know what we're doing to stay there. But I think where we will make real progress is trying to 
uh, move outside our comfort zones. The vital importance of building networks, informal and formal. And here, obviously, we're very fortunate. We've got the, the obviously the UKRI networks. And in Glasgow, we run the Early Career Researchers Forum and Suicide and Self-Harm Researchers. And that provides a remarkable network, which when people then go to conferences, maybe as a one person going from one institution to a conference, there's this other, this ready-made network of people. But I think what's valuable is that providing that support of recognizing that you are, we're all in it together in the sense that we all have our own challenges, especially if you're doing a PhD, which is a, a lonely furrow. And it's really helpful, I think, to have those networks around us. So trying to do as much as we can, all of us. And again, that's responsible in us as established researchers, as well as, um, as obviously yourselves trying to make your journey, make your way in this journey. There's also recognition come to an end now, Joe, the recognition of the importance of this idea of teen science is that we all have different roles in, in mental health research and recognizing that each of those roles is valued. And crucially, obviously, now is a central role of people with lived and living experience. And of course, in mental health research, we all have lived experience. So we're all bringing something to the table. And then the, the, the other bit about rejection is obviously what's part and parcel of all of our careers and all of the work that we do is that rejection. And I know of rejections in grants, rejections in papers, and, and I certainly know from uh, early on in my career, we didn't talk about that at all. I remember being, I remember my first paper, I it went through two rounds of revisions and the, re, the reviewer still wanted more. And I, I said, oh my God, I just thought my paper was so rubbish that I never completed those revisions. And, and I wasn't able to talk to somebody. I didn't feel able to talk to my supervisor at the time or I'd left, left him, but in terms of I'd moved to another to a lectureship career, but I didn't think, I just thought I was such a failure that Oh my God, I couldn't tell him because then he would know I'm this failure. And I, obviously it was a ridiculous idea. I should have, and I, I, I regret I didn't complete those final round of revisions. And of course we still get re rejections today and that's just the nature of the beast. And again, that's why it's important to talk about them and we support each other in doing that. Okay, so the last thing just is a message of hope. I think we are really fortunate. I think we're working now in a field which is there is this, whatever this leveling up agenda where we, we, mental health science is being prioritized more than it was 10 or 15 years ago. So it's a huge opportunity, not only for a career, but it's a huge opportunity to make a difference. But for us to make a difference, we have to look after ourselves and our own self-care, own self-compassion, because if we don't look after ourselves, we won't be able to do the work we want to do, and we certainly won't be able to live fulfilled lives. Okay, so that's the last thing from me. So open it up to comments or questions. Let me just open the chat here, if there's anything here. Thank you, Rory. That's brilliant. It's so fantastic to hear a bit of about your journey and, and some really helpful advice there as well. So we've got a few um, questions in Q&A, which I'll just be, someone else has raised their hand, but it'd be helpful if you could put your question into Q&A or chat. That's the easiest way to manage the questions, I think, as we're in a webinar format. So the first question, Rory, um, comes from Claire. How do you balance research demands with other academic demands? Self-care is so important, but it feels that academia has yet to catch up with the importance of self-care. Any thoughts on that? That's a, I mean, it's a great question, Claire. Um, it's difficult. There's no, no getting away from the fact that it's difficult. But what I try and do is align the other demands as much as possible with my research demands so that there's some sort of synergy. And, um, and also, I mean, so over the years, I've done a lot of, ever since I um, started out in the field, I got involved in the professional network. So, First of all, in the British Psychological Society, then in the, Interna the International Academy for Suicide Research, and then with the International Association for Suicide Prevention and whatever health psychology organizations as well. And the reason, part of the reason for doing that, obviously, was to extend my network, but also to help build people around me who could support me and uh, who I could then turn to, to to ask for support. So go, well, actually speak to a mentor, either formal or informal, go, somebody's asking to do this thing. Do I really do you think I should just say yes or I should say no? And then just talk through the pros and cons. That would just be very practical. Please, if you don't have a mentor, try and, and, and each organization does it differently, but um, that's so so important. So trying, even if it's an informal mentor, um, really, really important. But I think you're right, we still have academia still is catching up. Thanks, Rory. And of course, it can feel harder to say no when you're at early stages of your career, mm. can't it? When you don't want to uh, miss out opportunities yeah. or be let people down um okay another question here is there anything you wish someone had told you at the beginning of a career in mental health research um 
probably a couple of things. One is to say no. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a measured no because um, because you, because again, it's finding that balance between you do, this opportunity and serendipitous things happening as a result of that. So it's something about there's something about that. I think of that. That's why I think it's important. I would. I was really fortunate. I, I would. Well, I have a twin brother, as some people know, who's also a psychologist. So I've always had this informal mentor who I could always say, should I say no to this or not? And then I've had really great people as informal mentors throughout my career, separate from Daryl. Um, but the other one is. Um, it's so, it, so it's, I think the best learning is when you get things wrong or when you don't know something and, and, and taking it constructively. Because I, I remember I really used to take feedback to heart. And again, with the same as this idea with this first paper of mine of not thinking I wasn't good enough to write that paper or to overcome the challenges. So I think it's that, it's that, that feedback is constructive and, and don't take it to heart because we all get it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pick up on an another question here about more serious mental illness. So how do we bring more serious mental illness to the forefront? You talked a little bit about this at the end. Often they are portrayed in a negative light on TV while changing. I think it problematizes very vulnerable groups and even words like she's a psycho is so stigmatizing. So this is a big question for you, Roy, but you know, how do we go about removing that stigma, addressing those issues? I mean, that's I mean, it's such an important question, um, um, I, mean, I don't have the, all the answers, but what we try and do in the suicide prevention field is we, so we work closely with the media, with journalists, with other people who are in positions of influence to try and challenge those stigmas and uh, try and uh, minimize the stigmatizing language. So even just specifically, on suicide, there are media guidelines on how you should report about suicide. Now, there's also media guidelines about talking about mental health more generally. And I just think that we, all of us have responsibility every time we see it, that we call it out. And I certainly will call it out whenever I see it, irrespective of whether it is exactly the example you've just given about stigmatizing language about serious mental illness or in the context of suicide. And so I just think we, we just have to continue to do that and fight that battle um, yeah. because it is a battle but it's hopefully we are making progress yeah we can all play a part in changing that culture around language and so on thanks um there's a question what's that sorry oh no just sorry oh, i've just seen there's a question on co-production yeah so there's a couple of questions here all on right. imposter syndrome and co-production so both of those are areas we're going to pick up on a little in the ask the expert sessions and throughout the rest of the forum so i was trying to kind of pull out first of all the ones that are uh, sorry particularly around um your work and mental health um and other areas so one here i'm wondering do you think it's good for a phd candidate to try different research methodologies or is it better to kind of stick with a a primary focus, you know, stick with one in their PhD? Well, I mean, I, I've always, the message was always driven the work that I've done is, um, is what's the best method to answer the question you want to address? And, um, and for some that may be qualitative methods, for others might be quantitative measures, methods, it could be big data, whatever it may be. So, I, I, so the, to answer that question is, it has to fit with your research questions. Now, of course, um, if you can, if you can, Combine both, which is learn a new methodology to answer your to your answer your questions. Of course, that I would I would encourage that. And indeed, when you're going for jobs, you've another stranger of both. So the more more skills that you have, of course, the better. But I think for me, what's most important is it has to fit the question because actually one thing which does annoy me sometimes in the field, not just in mental health, but in research more generally, is when we have this siloed approach of quantitative people versus qualitative people, and as if this I mean, that's just a ridiculous dichotomy because, of course, that's not what it should be about. It should be about the methods which answer the question. So we all have a responsibility to move the field forward in a way which is, I mean, a mixed approach, which, which obviously values equally all different approaches. Thank you. And another question from a second year PhD student, Emma. Um, you mentioned you would have liked more time between your PhD and postdoc lecture position to hone your skills. I think you talked about time to breathe as well. Are there any skills or projects you think are most important to try and pick up to help yourself stand out as you move ahead to the next stage in your career? In terms of, um, 
Well, I think in, in academic career, obviously, the prior, the, there is a focus on publication. So I would really try and focus initially on trying to get your papers out. Uh, and, and that can be easier said than done, depending on the nature of your research. Because if you're doing longitudinal research, that's much more difficult. But with the emphasis now on, usually now in a, or often in a PhD, there's a systematic review. You can get, hopefully you can get that out as well as others. So I would try and demonstrate, because what I'm looking for is an, an, an employer is, that, that you've got demonstration of your skills, of course, and part of that will be writing, but also just demonstrating project management and time, time management. And that might be that over the course of your life outside doing other things, you've been able to juggle different commitments. And I think that's really important now as we look at people having different journeys. So mine was a very traditional journey through research, but thankfully now we have this much more, much richer journey people can go through to go through um, which is looking beyond what pre precise research skills so life skills I'm also looking for life skills but I'd say the most important thing for me is when I'm looking for when I interview somebody is enthusiasm passion and, and commitment and, and that and commitment isn't about all the hours it's because it's so important to have the work-life balance and I really do believe that um, but that is passion for me. That's what I'm looking for. Passion, because passion is a thing which will overcome so many hurdles. When you have the darkest of days, and you think this PhD or this project's never going to get done, that's what gets you through it. So that's what I always look for, number one. Brilliant. Thanks, Rory. So I think we're going to have to draw the questions to an end there. Unfortunately, we could go on and chat about this for a lot longer, and there's more coming in. What we'll do is capture the questions that have been submitted and obviously we can send them to Rory and, and you might be able to respond individually. We'll also take them to the panel tomorrow afternoon and make sure we're discussing these throughout the rest of, of the forum. So thanks to all of you who've submitted questions and if you feel your question hasn't been answered, do get, do get in touch. Um, but I'm going to close the session now by thanking Rory. That was brilliant, really helpful to hear about your journey and your experience and um, all your, your research, which is fantastic. Um, just to let you know, we're going to have a 10 minute break now, and then please look at your program because after the break, we're going to be moving into parallel sessions and there's a separate Zoom link meeting for each of the different parallel sessions. So please um, click on the link, to the session, session you want to attend to, but we look forward to seeing you there, but have a quick break in the meantime and we'll see you shortly. So thanks all. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks so much, Rory.